I will check my phone at dinner and you will deal with it. This was the title of an article on a blog called TechCrunch. The writer claimed that our phones make us more social at dinner rather than less social. He claimed that the constant access to Facebook, Twitter, and the endless social network stream actually gave us political sound bites and other fun, interesting things to talk about at dinner. As a digital strategist and someone who uses social media to help corporations reach people at dinner, I not only wanted to accept this, I wanted to tweet this. <laughs> and I did accept this, right up until I got to the middle of the article. And then I was angry. I was furious. And I couldn't figure out why. And then it dawned on me, I was taught manners. I knew it was absolutely rude to have your phone on the table at dinner. So what was the problem? Well, there were parts of my job, and worse still, my behavior, that were conflicting with my value system. In fact, I was pretty much exactly like this guy. Check my email really quick. Oh my god. Huffington Post has the top 10. <laughs> and I one more text. Software update. I gotta watch these movies and they're gonna return. Help. Gary? Gotta check my texts, get my email. Fred? Help. More text. I gotta watch all these movies before they have to return them. Up on my queue and <laughs> top ten family photos. I can just send one more text. I think the reason I want to just my DVR. No, I, oh, please I'm put it check down. My Facebook update. I can Tumblr. Fred, wait, please. You know what's happening, right? You're just spiraling. You're out of control. Yeah. No, there's too many things going on. But I have to check my text. You're out, right? Help me, please. I'm please trying. help me. Please help me out. Feel familiar? This is Fred from the TV show Portlandia, having what can best be described as a complete brain meltdown. This is what I want to talk to you about today, the effect of our many digital screens on our brains, our creativity, and more importantly, our society's ability to grow. But first, I have a confession to make. Hi, my name is Caroline, and I am a digital addict. This is where you say, hi, Caroline. <laughs> Very nice. Now, I know you're probably sitting in your seats thinking, digital addict, what does this mean? She tweets too much, or she Facebooks from the bathroom. Well, yes, <laughs> but that's not the reason why. Addictions always start innocently enough, whether it's, oh, I'll just throw up my dinner just this once to fit into this wedding dress, or Oh, I'll just have a shot of Jack at work because, I mean, it's a tough work day. <laughs> Mine started very similarly and spiraled madly out of control. I would take bathroom breaks, not because I had to go to the bathroom while at dinner, but because I had to take a social media break. That's because if I didn't check in on Facebook or Twitter, I would literally be in such a state of panic that I had no idea what was coming out of the other person's mouth. I would spoon my iPhone 5 in the middle of the night rather than my loved one. He, being the more intelligent one in the relationship, would take the phone out of my clenched fist, put it back on the iPhone charger, and in the morning, I would actually get upset and ask why he would remove my beloved iPhone. It's funny, but like the alcoholic that goes to the party and rips off his pants, it's pretty sad, too. Having a digital addiction is much like having an addiction to food. We've got to eat, right? Well, I, like all of you, carry a cell phone, which makes this pretty much a pain in the ass. There are several signs of the digital addict, but the one I want to focus on with you today is multitasking. Have you ever started an email and you write a couple sentences and then you open up a funny YouTube video, you watch the video, and then you go back to the email, you write a few more sentences, and then someone gives you a phone call, and you go back to the email, and you write a few more sentences, and then you may or may not actually finish the email. In fact, you may forget that you were writing the email at all. But OK, our day requires a specific amount of multitasking just to get through. But here's the dirty little secret about multitasking. You're not more efficient. You're just doing many things badly. 
People who multitask all the time can't filter out irrelevancy. They can't manage a working memory. They're chronically distracted. Nas claimed that literally we are changing the way our brains conduct business. He describes our brains as plastic, not elastic, meaning when we barrage our brains with all these endless tasks, it doesn't just snap back into place like a rubber band. In fact, as I stand here before you, sorry, this is just the product of my brain. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> So here I was, <laughs> down the rabbit hole of an addiction, literally acid burning through my brain, affecting my overall health. I was losing my memory completely. Now I ask you, what is a human being without memory? I couldn't remember my first kiss or the last conversation I had with my grandmother. I had blank space where my brain used to be. In fact, even now, I have to schedule really menial tasks, like shave, or take dog out, or remind Jenna not to talk in the middle of American Horror Story, because clearly Jessica Lange's character needs absolute silence for her greatness. <laughs> but OK. Why would I say that I have an addiction rather than a simple balance issue? Well, the answer lies in a little bit of brain science. Scientists have found that every time you receive an email or a text message, a neurotransmitter is released in your brain called dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel good. I mean, it's like that devil on your shoulder behind all your secret cravings from sex, alcohol, gambling, that pesky little cupcake craving. Because we feel good, we seek more, and sometimes to the detriment of the physical experience right before us. When the absolute obsession and chronic need for dopamine comes to a tipping point, this is an addiction. The psychology community does not identify digital as an addiction, but I didn't need the psychology community to tell me what I knew from the absolute chaos that was going on within. My brain was fried. Am I the only one struggling with all these digital screens? Where is your phone right now? Is it calmly resting away from you in your purse or coat? Or is it in your pocket so you can feel the buzz of an email so that when we have a break, you can rush out and go check it? Or maybe it's in your hands. While I am struck by what all this digital overload has on our relationships with family and friends, that's not what I want to focus on with you today. Instead, what I want to focus on is the effect that all this digital abuse has on our creative thinking and therefore our society's ability to grow. Creative thinking allows solutions to some of the world's biggest problems. From Plato's journey to find out whether it is indeed better to be just rather than unjust, to Obama's attempt to take on the healthcare system. These are no small challenges. They take vast investigation of the far corners of the human mind. It takes focus and something not instantly valued, but incredibly necessary. Daydreaming. Think back to that last time that you were trying to remember a song. You just couldn't, couldn't for the life of you remember it. And then all of a sudden, here you are in the shower, scrubbing your hair, and it comes to you like an aha moment. What happened there was you allowed yourself to disconnect and daydream. What's more, there's no cell phone in the shower, unless you're an interesting person that likes to plastic baggy, but I really don't recommend that. <laughs> What's more, you're alone in there. Nobody can reach you. You've got the space to daydream. Daydreaming requires a look around. But we can't look around while we're always looking down. Down at our phones, down at the street, down at the cash register, down, 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 down. Where is the world at? It's up here. The only problem is we can't look around while we're always looking at our phones. 
Just over the weekend, I was working at a cafe in Brooklyn when I looked up and saw this photograph on the wall. This is a remembrance to four regulars of the cafe. Actually, two had passed away on the right side. That's Jenny on the right end with her arms crossed. I, I sort of see her as the, the badass of the group because she's looking away. Next to her is Rocco. He's grinning away at the camera. I imagine that he gives everyone a wink and a smile as they pass by, that kind of warmness and openness that you wouldn't expect from someone from New York City, but clearly is the man's calling card. I imagine that these four have been sitting on this bench for most warm summer nights of their adult lives. They've been organizing the neighborhood watch and trying to figure out how to keep their city streets clean. They've been doing it from this bench, and they've been doing it without cell phones, Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. We are all so much more capable than 140 characters on Twitter. We're capable of miracles, but we're never going to see that until we get our heads out of our phones. My miracle is standing on this stage. And I promised I wouldn't get upset, but you know what? This is a wild ride, so here we are. <laughs> For a girl that just told you about her broken brain, to be delivering this to all of you is nothing short of a miracle, even if I'm doing it with note cards. Man, it's a wild ride when you don't even cry in front of family and friends and then you're on a stage. Whew. <sighs> I am the only one who controls my suffering. Suffering is a big word. It's a scary word. It's the kind of word we usually associate with chronic illness, for example. But every time you deny yourself a sleep just to get the work done, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But I assure you those moments add up. It was the absolute understanding to my core that this was real pain, and further, that I, I could do something about it that changed everything for me. It took boundary setting. I'd like to share three paths with you to limit the noise that's crushing our ability to focus and give you the space to daydream. Detox. Put your phone in airplane mode when you sleep. Or even better still, Take it outside of your bedroom entirely. It turns out when we sleep and we receive emails and text messages, your brain is still subconsciously aware, and you can't actually get into the deepest depths of sleep known as REM. Reduce your response time to every email. Let's be honest with ourselves. Not everything needs an immediate response. It turns out that my own crazy obsession with responding to people came from a fear of rejection. I thought if I didn't respond to someone right away that I wouldn't be loved. This is absolutely false. And what's more, others will respect you more when they see you giving yourself the time you need. Turn all those Facebook and Twitter notifications on your phone off. I used to get one every 60 seconds. Literally, my phone would light up. It got to the point where I couldn't read a book. I would read two sentences, I'd lose my place, and then I just would give up. For a former philosophy major and current writer, that's absolutely horrific. Let it in. I took this photo on a bike ride from LA to Long Beach. There's another reason why us bikers, runners, and yogis take time out of our day to do this, and it has nothing to do with exercise. It's one of the only moments where you don't have any screens whatsoever, and it's your time. You have space to daydream and come up with the most amazing things. Don't pack your day airtight with meetings. Don't open more than three browser screens on your, on your computer. I do that, 14 sometimes. <laughs> Allow yourself some space for some happenstance. I now schedule it in my calendar, I'm not going to lie. It says, Phil, that's it. And I put my phone in airplane mode. Giving your space, yourself the space to daydream is absolutely critical. Find your journey. 
Make a mission statement and tell everyone you know what it is, even if you have no idea how to get from point A to point B. My own mission statement is using social media to help solve the world's problems. Now I know, I just told you all about my digital demons, but that doesn't mean that I don't absolutely believe that social media is one of the most enabling technologies that our world has. It is my passion, it is my job, it just took a little bit of balance. So I go back to the way I started with dinner. I will check my phone at dinner and you will deal with it. Bullshit. We don't need our phones to give us funny anecdotes. We have this amazing thing called a brain that's now degunked and ready to go. I invite you to dinner at my house. We won't have cell phones on the table. We'll talk about how stressed out we are about Christmas shopping, our career path, or that dude you met at the airport bar. We'll create, debate, and connect deeply. We'll daydream out loud. This means less time mindlessly staring at our screens and more time creatively thinking. If all of us do this together, it's the difference between a trickle in the scream and the Niagara Falls. And you know what? Society will thank us for it. Thank you. That's all I have.